We hope you enjoy today's message on Acts chapter 2 verse 38 preaching channel. Please like, comment, subscribe, share, and hit the bell to help us grow. We're starting a new uh, series tonight called The Blessed Life. And I'll tell you, I got a lot of this, this uh, information from somebody else. Half of it from somebody else, half of it from me, but it's biblical, it's sound, and, uh, and I'll tell you what it's about. It's about stewardship of our finances and how that blesses our life. Thank you, Brother uh, Dwayne, for saying on me or whatever you said. Oh, joy. Okay. <laughs> and uh, I have a, a lesson to teach, and we have a, a, a Bible school called Purpose Institute in Oregon, and, and I've teach at it uh, occasionally, and last quarter I taught, and I got to choose what I taught, and, and this quarter they just asked me to choose the date, so I did, and it's a minister and his finance, and so it's, oh good, <laughs> so I get to hit this again, but it's very important, and we're going to find out, Jesus talks more about money than he does heaven or hell. Why? Because it's a tangible thing that we can manage in a way that honors him, or if we don't manage it right, it dishonors him. And so this series of lessons is not meant to put a guilt trip on anybody. This is meant to encourage you. When I was very young as a pastor, 26 years old, I remember as I began to teach about it, it was like I was intimidated because I wasn't, you know, I'm, I'm begging for money. I'm tell but it's not for me. It's for you. I want you to be blessed. God has blessed me. And these are proven principles that God has blessed me by in my life. And just at the outset, and I'll probably say this again at least once during our journey, I pay tithe just like you pay tithe. I pay tithe to the United Pentecostal Church of Oregon and have for decades. I'm going to sit up here. I can see you all from up here. And uh, so... I pay tithe uh, on my gross of my income that I get from the church. Now it just so happens I'm the district superintendent. So part of my pay comes out of tithe. But I don't get any of my tithe that I tithe into the district. So it goes there and it's put in a pot and then it's subtracted from the pot at the end of the month and then the percentage that comes to me is announced and then the tithe of that is subtracted out of the pot and given to the district. So I'm double tithing, and I'm not taking that money as income. I'm putting it away in another fund for a retirement. And so I'm really not taking the money, but it, I'm paying tithe on it. And I don't begrudge that at all because God has proven himself that because I have given that part of my life to him and given what belongs to him, and we're going to see, we're going to go through first the principle of of, uh, of the harvest, then we're going to go through the principle of the first fruits, and then we're going to go through not just tithe, but tithe and offering, and how God promises to bless and multiply that. There's a man that used to attend our church. He's moved to Texas now. His name was Mike Burr. He attended here for several years. I taught him Bible studies, and uh, he got baptized, got the Holy Ghost, and then he, one day I walked into the house, and he said, sit down, preacher. I want to ask you a question. And he asked me about tithe, and I said, well, Mike, I don't know if you're ready for that. He said, I want to hear it. And so as I began to talk to him, this is what built his faith. He tried God out. This is the one way in which we can prove God. He says, bring all the tithe into the storehouse. Prove me and see if I won't pour out a blessing that you cannot contain. Well, what was cool is as he began to give God to God, God began to bless. And as he gave, God began to bless. And I'm just going to tell you this story just to, as a teaser kind of, is he says, well, I'm going to tithe. And then one day I walk back in and he says, okay, pastor, do I do it on my gross or on my net? And I said, well, you tell me how Israel did it. Well, Israel paid tithe before they had a king to pay taxes to. And when they wanted a king, God says, well, you're gonna, it's going to cost you more. He didn't say, well, take it out of my pocket and give it to the king. No, he says, no, that's not my way of doing it. And so they didn't get a discount. He says, oh, okay. And you'd have to know Mike. He, was, he, he could be a little grumpy. And, and uh, he was very gruff. And so he did it. And then uh, he says, wow, he, he had all this stuff he was showing me. And when we began having Bible studies, he was 65 years old and his body was breaking down. He worked in a warehouse and he said, I want to retire in five years. I said, I know because the kids will be raised. Yeah. I said, I'm praying for God to retire you in two years. 
And he says, well, we'll see, preacher. We'll see how that works. So as we began to pray, then he began to give. And then he started giving me these illustrations. You know what? Uh, uh, I started paying my tithe. I have money at the end of the week. And I've never had money at the end of the, the week all my adult life. And he'd worked since he was 18 years old. He said, I never had enough. Now I have enough. And then he had these children that he had adopted. And they were special needs kids that came through the system. And so he got a certain amount every month for the, those kids. They were drug babies that he had adopted. And he says, I got another question for you. And he says, do I pay tithe on that? And I said, you tell me. It's increase. Okay. <laughs> so he did. And this was what was really cool. He said, sit down. I got to tell you. I said, what happened? He says, you know what? I started paying tithe and Manny had to go to the doctor and he'd been to the doctor. The hospital called me up and gave me back my copay of $1,500. And he started laying it all out in a line. And lo and behold, two years from the day almost that we started Bible studies, he retired. And he said, I have more money left over at the end of the week after retiring than I did in the beginning. But what it was, it was a faith builder. So I want you to see this as a faith builder to test God, try God, see what he'll do. And uh, uh, we all have stories, and some people will tell stories and say, I gave $50, and God gave it right back. God didn't do that for me. But I can see in the long run how God has blessed my life. And my father and mother taught me to do this when I was a very small child. And my dad would say, well, God's going to bless you not just financially, but he'll bless your life, period. How many want God, your life to be blessed by God? I do. And I want your life to be blessed by God. And so whether you tithe or not, God's going to take care of me. But I want him to take care of you, and I want him to give abundantly into your bosom. So it's all about the heart. This is what we're going to talk about today. So what is the most selfless thing you've ever seen anybody do? Can th anybody think of a very selfless thing or unselfish thing that you've seen somebody do or somebody did for you? Did anybody have an example? I'm, yes. You help me get started for anybody. Okay. Yes. Oh, awesome. Just out of nowhere. Isn't it amazing how people give? You know, I, I was walking through the church Sunday, and, and Brother Mark says, one of the Nepalese wants to talk to you. Okay. And they gave me a gift card. Happy New Year's. New Year's is when they give their gifts, not Christmas. So I got a Christmas gift on New Year's. Is that I, I've seen people stop and help me change a tire when they did, really didn't need to. Or they stop when you've run off the road, and they help you push back on the road. I've had people stop and help me when I broke down. And so it, it made me learn they, hadn't, they weren't going to get paid for it. They weren't going to get something back in return. But the most unselfish thing that others had done for us or we've seen done kind of becomes stamped in our memory. I'm going to read from Matthew chapter number 7, verses 1 and 2. And Jesus is saying these words. And this is right at the tail end of the Sermon on the Mount. And he says, Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with what measure you use, it will be measured back to you. So anybody can answer this question, and I like a little interaction, is uh, one, give one word that's the main subject of this scripture. Judge. Okay, very good. It's about judging. Now, often when we hear this scripture, we think about money, right? Whatever you measure you measure out with, it's given back to you. But the subject matter in this case is judging. So if we reread that scripture, it is about judging. And you read it and it says, judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And with what measure you use, it shall be measured to you again. So is there anything about money in that scripture? Not a thing about money in that scripture. Is the money, word money used in that scripture? Okay. So, huh? Not at all, right? I don't see it anywhere in there. So commit the following to short-term memory. Judge not that you be not judged. With the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. So God has a principle. If we judge harshly, it's going to come back to us. 
if we judge generously, it's going to come back to us. God uses the measuring table I use to give back to me. That's just, isn't it? So if I'm stingy with God, and he's a little stingy with me, oh well, he said, you chose the measuring cup. And that's just the principle that he works by. One of the things that God hated was an unjust measure. This is why. When they go to the market, they didn't have it marked on the outside of the package, one pound of hamburger. They would put the product on the scale, and then they would put the money on the scale, and they would get it to balance out and say, okay, this is yours. So they had, they had just, they had measurements, they had according to theirs, like they'd have a one ounce and a one pound and a two pound and a five pound, and you put it on the scale, and you put the product on the scale and say, okay, and this is how much I'll give for you. But some people would cut it out, and that they, they would make a six pound weight that said it was five pound weight or vice versa or a four pound weight that they said was five and then you're, you're really not getting what you paid for. So God hates injustice or God hates a cheat. That's the same thing. It's in the same category as lying. So I'm going to read the first and the last phrase of Luke's version of Jesus' words. As we know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the same uh, stories often tell, told, and I'm going to read it to you, and then we're going to look at it in the scripture. It says, judge, and you shall not, judge not, and you shall not be judged, for with the me same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. So I have a question for you. Does anybody remember the prayer, the tax collector and the Pharisees? What happened there? He's too proud. So they're out there, and they're on the corner praying. That just happened to be the way they do it. The Bible says, go in your closet, and you, God will reward you openly with whatever you do in secrecy. And that's one of the things I say is that I'm not going to tell you exactly how much I give, but I'm going to tell you I do practice these things. So we don't all stand up and wave our money and say, this is what we're putting in the pot. And it's not about our attention getting thing. I detest that. I don't like that at all. In fact, there's only been one time in our local church where I've taken verbal pledges. Does anybody remember it? It was a Christmas for Christ offering several years ago. And we had a fabulous offering, but I felt the Holy Ghost say, okay, take pledges. And it kind of motivated us. But here what we're seeing is the tax collector and the Pharisee are playing. And the Pharisee says, I thank you that I'm not like this tax collector. I'm righteous. I give tithe of everything I owe. I give to the poor. I do all this great stuff. And the tax collector wouldn't even lift up his eyes. And he said, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus asked the question of the Pharisees that were around, which man went home to his house justified? And they said, oh, the tax collector. So this is the connotation or this is the story or this is the setting with which Jesus is addressing the judgment call. And, and so he said, you know, if we show mercy, we'll get mercy. I just want you to know that if you're putting mercy, if you're showing mercy, it's going in the bank. If you're showing judgment, it's going in the bank. And God's the banker, so he keeps track. So oftentimes I've had to backpedal myself and say, now, how would I want others to treat me? And that's a whole nother lesson, which we call the golden rule, do as un unto others, is that you would have others do unto you. You know, the Bible says, forgive if you want to be forgiven. So, which would you rather be, the tax collector or the Pharisee? I mean, at the end of the day, I'd rather be the tax collector. I'd rather go home justified. So he owned his stuff, and he asked for mercy, and he received mercy. But the Pharisee, he just went home with his pride. So we're going to read this same verse of scripture out of Luke chapter number 6 and verse number 37. It says, judge not and you shall not be judged. Condemn not and you shall not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. So I think this is important. So now we're seeing the sequence, right? We're seeing the measuring that God is using and we're seeing that he uses it whether it's forgiveness or judgment. So forgive and you'll be forgiven. Judge and you'll be judged. Don't judge and you won't be judged. Now that doesn't mean the world's going to treat us that way, but we're talking about how God's going to respond to our life. 
That's why the scripture says, if you want to be forgiven, then forgive your brother. So we have to learn to forgive our brother so we can be forgiven. Now that might seem weird that that would be our motivation. Well, initially it might be our motivation, but then it becomes a habitual thing that when somebody offends us, we forgive them because we've been forgiven. So sometimes we forgive to be forgiven, and then it gets to where we forgive because we've been forgiven. So I hope we can flip in our mindset why we give to God somehow tonight. And the next verse reads this way. Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. So this is is not just judging This is about everything in our life. So Jesus is not just telling a story. He's trying to give a revelation of a principle that works in many areas of our life. It's about judging, not money, initially. So most of the time, we do not need to know the Greek to understand the Bible more clearly. All we need to know is our mother tongue. I have found out usually when I study scripture, it still means what I thought it meant when I get to the end of it. And I have to obey it or choose not to obey it. And if I choose not to obey it, there's a consequence. And if I choose to obey it, then there is a reward for obeying. My pet peeve with some that teach or preach is that they use words out of context or scriptures out of context. You ever heard a sermon where somebody uses something out of context? I have a friend that likes to do that. He's a topical preacher. In other words, an expository preacher will preach through a set of, of, of scriptures that are in a row. A topical one say, we're going to talk about repentance. And they pick and cherry pick and choose out of the scripture, which, which both are legitimate kinds of way of study and expository preaching or expository teaching. But I have this friend that he will choose a, a word and then it's like, wait a minute, that doesn't mean what you said it meant. And he'll use play on words to make it sound funny, fancy. Ever heard that? Ever caught yourself doing that? <laughs> yeah, because you're, you've heard this scripture over and over, and you're in the middle of an argument or a debate, and then you just boom, you shoot that scripture out, and then you go, well, that really didn't fit there. So this is what's funny. I served on a national committee with this man, and I'd bug when he When he'd preach out of context, I'd say, Phew. And I'd call him by his first name and said, good job, man. That was pretty fancy footwork there. And then we were on a, then another preacher came and preached who's on the same committee. And when he preached, I said, man, what an awesome message. And it was in context too. (laughs) And my friend that likes to preach out of context responded to that and say, I get you, man of God. And I text back and said, did I say your name? <laughs> but he knows that's who he is. It's, and, and he uses the plays on word. And I remember hearing a story years ago. T.F. Tenney was a, a, a powerful man of God and very influential in the United Pentecostal Church for years. He died a couple years ago. And he said, uh, there was an old Southern preacher, and he's from Louisiana. And he says, you got to you got to realize what you're reading. And there was a scripture that he used out of Psalm 1833. It says, he makes my feet like hind's feet and sets me upon the high places. Does anybody know what hind's feet are? What? Deer. Deer. They're deer. They're hinds. Well, the old guy was a little bit ignorant and not quite literate. And he read it and he said, he makes my feet like hen's feet. I'm going to preach tonight about chicken toed religion. And he preached a sermon about chicken-toed religion. It was a little country church. And Brother Tenney said he just laughed and he hawed. He said, I don't know what he said, but he was preaching on chicken-toed religion. (laughs) Because he launched from the wrong place. So sometimes we've got to be careful. So I want to explain what I'm saying here. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a little grammar lesson here. And we're going to figure out what is being said here. So the grammar lesson in this passage of scripture is give. Give is the verb, right? So, uh, and then it says, you give, 
which is the implied subject, and it is the objective pronoun. It must be replaced with something. So here he's saying, you give, and when you give, it will be given back to you. So whatever we give. So there's a principle here. That's why he says, you give judgment, and it will be given to you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. It's coming back big. It's like, you know, some people talk about karma equal. No, it just bounces really back. And I don't know about you, but there's been times in my life where it really comes back bad. Right? You don't honk at somebody, so they put on their brakes, and it comes back really bad. And you're looking at somebody, and you're honking at them and going like this, and then you look up, and the traffic stopped right in front of you. Sometimes it can, it's like watching these karma things on YouTube, right? And I, does anybody like to watch those? Okay, there's the guilty pleasure here. You know, it's the guy kicks the car window from his motor scooter and he flips over, you know? It's like that. they didn't quite think that through. The anger just grabbed and you went. And, but we can't live our life that way. And what Jesus is trying to get his disciples to do is stop and think about what they do and the repercussions that will happen because of what they do. So we could put almost anything in this in our life. In, that, in fact, what Jesus was saying is you give and whatever you give will be given back to you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. This is a law of the heart. This is an attitude. This is a motive. Jesus is big on motives. He's big on motives. That's why when he said, the law says don't commit adultery, and I say don't even think about it. The law says don't lust. I said don't even think about it. Don't even go there. You know, so the law of Christ is a little stricter than the law of the Old Testament. Why? Because the Spirit of Christ is in our heart, and it should check us. And we have the Spirit check us. Did the Holy Ghost checked you recently? Oh, no. You guys are perfect. I'm not. It's checked me recently. And I've had to check my motive and say, okay, back up. So there, that's the law of the heart. But there was a law of the harvest in Jesus' days. Now, it was mostly an agrarian society. That means that they were farmers. There were a few that were not farmers. And they had their plots of land and they grow their... How many had a garden when they were a kid? Some of you may still have a garden. But it's like, yeah, we're going to go out. Mom planted beans and carrots and, and squash, and we hope that wouldn't grow, and cucumbers, and, you know, w- we planted all this stuff, and you get back whatever you give. Well, I remember when we were first married, we, didn't, we had an apartment, so we went out to the Reynolds house, and we decided to plant a, a garden. Well, we planted a row of corn, and we planted a row of beans, and we planted a row of zucchini. We could have planted three zucchini plants, and it would have been enough. You know, it's whatever you plant, it comes back good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Here was the law of the harvest of Jesus' day. The harvesters would get paid by the bushel or by, uh, it was volume measurement. And so what they would do is they would go through and they would harvest and they would just drop it in their basket and come and say, okay, I got a peck or I got a bushel. But there, there was also a rule in the law of the harvest is that they had to leave stuff in the corners. They didn't harvest the corners of the field. And that was to be left for the poor. Now, this is an interesting concept that's not alive in our nation today, is that if they, if they were poor, they could eat, but they had to go out to the field. If they didn't own property, they could go into the landowner's property, and they could glean is what they could, would call it. And they were allowed a certain amount. The harvesters that were hired would just loosely pile in the basket and bring it for their pay, but the gleaners would press it down, shake it together, get it as full as they could. Why? Because they needed that for them. And there's a law of the harvest, and so they understood what they were talking about. He was saying, whatever you give, you're going to get back more. That's God's economy. That's a principle. It goes clear back to creation is you have the seed, the principle of the seed. You don't sow an apple, you sow a seed, right? 
Now, there's a few plants like uh, potatoes. You can plant a potato, you know, that has eyes in it. And, uh, and a potato will grow, perhaps, or uh, maybe an avocado or something like that. But when, when God created the heavens and the earth, he created everything with its seed in it. Seeds will produce not just an apple, but an apple tree. And an apple tree will produce many apples with many seeds, and you will always get back more than you give. The Bible says if we go and sow in the field of, of the harvest of souls, it, some will give 30, some 60, some 100, unless it's wayside ground, unless it's thorny ground, unless it's stony ground. And what's the answer? Prepare the ground. Get the ground ready, and it'll produce, yes. Yeah, and, and the, the literal King James says, shall men gab back into your bosom. The new King James says, shall people put back into your bosom. So you're right, because this is the interchange. It's with men. It's not like God shows up and knocks on your door and says, here's 20 bucks. No, it comes back some other way. Because, so it's in the economy. It's just like, forgive others, they will forgive you. Judge others, they will judge you. This is not about God necessarily, but it's about the principles that God put in place. So we know and we can understand and can relate to the apple. It's something that is important, and it's, the apple becomes more than it ever was or could be if it's planted. The seed does. So look at what Genesis 1 and 11 says. It says, and then God said, let the earth bring forth grass and herb and yield seeds and fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth, and it was so. And then you look even at the animals. It says, and so God created great sea creatures and everything that moves with which the waters abounded according to their kind, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good, and God multiplied them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters and the seas, and let the birds multiply on the earth. So it's about multiplication. God created that into creation. Whether it's a cow, or a bird, or a butterfly, or a human being, or a rhubarb plant. It brings forth after its own kind. It's supposed to have seed in itself. And in fact, the Lord just said it to all of creation except for man. He commanded them to be fruitful and multiply. So God knew that out of one could come many. So God expects more than what he gave. He, he just expects it to be that way. And in fact, when they didn't, when they decided they were not going to replenish the earth and they built the Tower of Babel, we see how that turned out, right? Yeah. Yeah. Turned out really good. It's near where modern day Baghdad is, as, soon as, it, as far as we can tell. But God confused the languages so they'd go and do what they, he intended for them to do. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. God likes full things. He doesn't like empty things. And there's something about an empty, hungry heart that God looks at and says, I want to fill that. And I believe he's more desirous to fill people with his spirit than they are to have it. So this tells me that Luke 6.38 is a great verse and a terrible verse. You know, the Old Testament speaks of the great and terrible day of the Lord in Joel chapter number 2. And for those of us that are ready, we say, that's a great day. And those that are not are going, ooh. If mortgage comes due and you have the payment, great, I got it. If you don't, oh, man, five days, ten days, when are they going to charge me a late fee? Oh, no, because we don't have it to give. And, and we know that it does come back. And all of us have experienced in our life somewhere a repercussion or a harvest that we forgot about. Both good and bad. You know? You give somebody a fender bender and you forget to leave a note. 18 years later, you're going, that's a little bit bigger dent than I was expecting. No, I, I'm just, 
I'm not saying anything about myself, but, you know. <laughs> it's just like, wow. <laughs> okay. And I didn't even pray for God to help me find the guy's driver's license number. You know, it's just like, oh, all right, I'll take that one. Next time I will report. And that's just one illustration. So we've learned that. And that's not a thing called karma. It's just the way life is. We give and it comes back to us. And I'm, it's just like when we give joy to somebody and kindness, it comes back to us. Not from everybody, but it will come, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. That's a principle of God's word. So if you give judgment in good measure, if you give judgment, it'll be pressed down, shaken together, and running over. So I have to ask myself, and we have to ask ourselves, what are we giving out and what measure are we using to give it out? And this is, we are going to go into giving of our finances to God because God loves a cheerful giver. One of the greatest illustrations, I, isn't, it, isn't it really more blessed to give than to receive? Or maybe let me put it this way. Isn't it a lot more blessed to give than to have to receive? That's probably the connotation with which we put it in. It says, ooh, I need to be given to it. And oftentimes you give to people and they go, oh, I'm so sorry. And, you know, don't be sorry. God has given to me so I can give to you. And, and it's, it's fun to give, right? Sometimes it's fun to get too. That's why we have Christmas presents. But, you know, it, but it's more blessed to give than to receive. So oftentimes God gives to us and we're blessed and it makes us motivated to give again. Isn't that what happens? Or say, when you give judgment and it comes back to you, it makes us less likely to give judgment. But the law of the harvest does work in God's kingdom. So whether it's anger or kindness or words or loving acts. Now, can Luke 6.38 receive, refer to money? Yes, it's an it. Remember the grammar lessons? You give and it will be given back to you. So there is a, is a scripture. You can build a sentence out of that. It's if you give anger, it will be given back to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. And us that had struggles with our anger say, amen. You know? <laughs> we thought our anger would fix it. It did. <laughs> fix this lip right here. You know, it's just like, it, that's the way the harvest works. Now, the best teacher of planting and sowing is the harvest. And we see that in kids. They still do today, and they did it in Sunday school last year. They plant a little plant, and they choose the right one, a radish, you know. It's going to sprout up in just a few days. But they learn the process in the little lot part of life, just like we teach our children the law of consequences. They pull their friend's hair. Their hair gets pulled back. Well, Sorry. He pulled my hair. What'd you do to him? He pulled my hair. What'd you do to him? Yeah, and you find out that they probably pulled their ear or something like that. And so they realize there was repercussions and we let our kids suffer with that and have to patch up the friendship so that they don't some, do something worse. And God lets that happen in your life and my life, not because he's an ogre, not because he hates us, because he wants us to learn that there's a law. And laws always work. And if you give with generosity, it will be given back to you with generosity. If you withhold judgment, judgment will be withheld from you. If you show mercy, it will be shown mercy to you. So we have a bank and it's our, our accounts being kept track of by God. Remember, it is the objective pronoun, and it must be replaced with something. I want us to understand that we must not use the principles of this passage as the motive for giving. We must see it as what it really is, a reward of giving. Getting. Do you get the difference? And we hear it, and I've heard it on, and we used to listen to it. I don't know why my parents did it. I think it was entertainment. We get off church on Sunday night. And we go home and mom would make scrambled egg sandwiches or fried bologna sandwiches or what. Anybody ever do that when they got off church on Sunday night? I mean, that's one of those wonderful memories or, you know, 
My dad liked to tear up white bread and put it in a bowl and put brown sugar on it and pour milk over it. And it's like, ah. no, I think I'll take the fried bologna sandwich. Thank you very much. But everybody had their own. Anybody have any weird comfort food? Anybody have any something weird? Yeah, what? What in milk? Applesauce. Okay. That, that works for you too, huh? Okay. So we have those things that you know, my dad would eat pickle and, and peanut butter sandwich. But it's just like, or onions and peanut butter sandwich. Or, and there we are. Stay away from him after he eat, you know. But we'd go home and we'd prepare, and we weren't rich. We were just, you know, lived on the edge kind of, I think. We had a home and we had a car, and, you know, but we weren't rich. And, but we'd sit down to eat, and there was a Waterloo, Iowa station on that, you know, used to be. All the radio stations were, you know, 25,000 watts or 10,000 watts, and during the day you could hear them, and at night they'd go to sleep, and you'd say, God bless America, or whatever, and or they play the Star Spangled Banner, and we're signing off, and you'll join us for in, for broadcast day tomorrow at 6 a.m. And then the blowtorch, clear channel stations would come out, and there was one out of Waterloo, Iowa, and they used to teach on giving, only they were charlatans, and it was the Reverend Ike, the Reverend Ike, and you'd have to look up the Reverend Ike, and he says, remember. The more you give, the more you get. Nothing from nothing leaves nothing. You used to listen to it too? I wonder why we did. I guess it was entertaining. And it was all about giving money. And then he said, look what I gave and look what God gave me. I got a Rolls Royce for every day of the week and I have a Chrome one for Sundays. Now, I don't know if he ever did, but then you go and look, and he did, and he was a charlatan. Then there was the original, Rose, uh, original Georgia prophet from Macon, Georgia, the Reverend Roosevelt Franklin, coming to you from Macon, Georgia. And he'd start preaching it. Oh, let's go to our drive-up testimony line. Hello, sister. What's that you're driving? A Cadillac. How did you get that? Oh, I gave to you, and God bless me. And, and so, yeah. That's not what we're talking about, folks. We don't give to get. We got, so we give. God has blessed us. And, and so we'll talk a little bit more about that principle uh, in a later lesson. But do you get it? If we back up a few verses, verse 30 sa says, give to anyone who asks. Verse 35 says, give and don't expect it to be paid back. And then it says, if you owe someone, don't use it as an excuse. So the Bible tells us, he's telling us how to treat money in the same sixth chapter of, of Luke. And then he goes and says, give and it shall be given. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. So out of that, I grew up with some principles that my dad said, don't loan anybody money unless you can do without it. And so I have. And it's shocking. Sometimes people come and they feel guilty because they owe me money, and then they disappear and never come back to church. So now everybody's going to come to me after church, but... What the deal is, is I'll say, I'll help you one time. This is a gift, not a loan. Do you hear me? One time, I'll give you a gift and I'll help you. And I'll give them a gift. And most of the time, they give it back. Sometimes they have it. But I realize I'm giving not to get. I'm giving because I have to give. Many times I've heard preachers say, give and you'll get, give and you'll get, give and you'll get, using it as that motivational tool. I want to get so I can give. Do you think God gets excited every time somebody says, give and you'll get? And he goes, yeah, they're getting it. Woo! I'm feeling it from the throne of heaven. They're giving so they can get rich. That's what I'm all about. Now, I don't think that's God at all. Not at all. And somehow, see, motive is a big thing to God. That's, that's a huge thing to God. Why we do what we do. Neither is this scripture for a series of lessons just to... In, it's not about me. It's about you. It's about us. So the lesson is not greed, but the lesson is about generosity. 
We give. So why are you giving? What's your motive in giving? God loves a cheerful giver, right? We've read that, right? Now, I've said this statement too, is if you're going to be a grump, just keep it in your pocket. Because God will provide for his church some other way, and you're not going to get any good out of it. Oh, okay, God, you said I have to do it, so here we go. Uh, then we're like the son that's left behind that sees the prodigal come home and says, well, I, you never threw a party for me. And his dad looks at him and says, you never opened the fridge, Right? It, all that I have is yours. You could have had a party any time. So probably the coolest illustration I ever saw of a cheerful giver was Brother Billy Cole one time at a meeting. Now, you'd have to know who Billy Cole was. Billy Cole's about five foot two. Any way you looked at it. <laughs> Just saying, Okay. I've read his book and I've heard him tell the story. He was a missionary to Thailand. And when they went to pick him up at the airport, they picked him up in a Morris Minor. That's like a mini version of the Mini Cooper. Okay? And he said when he get, went to get in, he backed in and he split the seat of his pants out. So when they got to where they were going, he said, Shirley, stand behind me. Shirley, stand behind me. That was his wife. And he was just, uh, I was, he's five foot two, and he, at his height, he probably weighed 570. So that's a bunch of mass. Now, he later lost weight and gained weight, and he just had a struggle in that area of his life. So he's probably 500 pounds when he's doing this, and he was talking to us about giving. Now, another thing about Brother Cole is that he had this contagious laugh. And I can't imitate his laugh. I have a friend named Doug Kleindens that was mentored by him, and he can imitate his laugh. In fact, Doug Kleindens' laugh sounds, sounds kind of like Billy Cole's laugh, like, <laughs> it's a, and he shakes like a bowl full of jelly when he laughs, you know? He did, and he knew it, and he'd talk about it. So we were at this meeting, and he says, God loves a cheerful giver, and the literal translation is, it's a hilarious giver. So he got money out of his pocket, and he walked up on the platform, and he started going, <laughs> he says, now, I only want you to give if you can give that way. Because, and, and it's kind of, you know, we go to the extremes to describe, but God's saying, no, this isn't about giving grudgingly, but this is about giving willfully. This isn't about giving to get. This is because we give because we have. And we give because we can. And it's a wonderful thing, as we discussed a little bit earlier, that when we have to give, it is more blessed to give than to receive. So we don't get to give, we get to give instead of give to get. So it's flipped. We get so we can give. And I'll tell you, it is the most wonderful thing. And you will see that's why one of the reasons why we take up the offering. It used to be before we'd get, welcome our guests that way, the pat, plate would just pass. And we wouldn't say anything. And I'm not saying anybody that does it any different is wrong, but it was just like, well, let's just give in secret. And let the Lord reward openly. And God does reward openly. And there will be a chance when we begin to get into the details of giving and tithing, we're all open it up to you to give a testimony how God has come back to you and visited you and blessed you in your giving. So that's got to be the place we get to as a church body if we're going to see a harvest of souls that Jesus desires to bring to Portland Pentecostals is that we get to give. God does not bless giving. He blesses giving with the right heart. God doesn't bless greed. So motive is everything again to God. So here's what it's all about. It's all about the heart. And if you have your Bible with you, that would be great. If you have a Bible app, that would be great. If you'd open it to Deuteronomy chapter number 15, verses 7 through 15, we're going to close out our lesson tonight with reading those verses. Here's the solution to greed. Here's the solution to not being generous. Because we want to break the greed in our life. Does anybody want to break that so that God 
can give to us so we can give again. And just so you know, you know, I remember when we were raising funds to, we raised 300 and some thousand dollars as a church to help remodel this church. And it was astounding how much people gave. It just, it, it just shook me how much people gave. But I remember one person said, I wish a millionaire would come in and just give us a million dollars. And I'd say, not me. I just want us all to give what we can give. Because this is what happens. Then God blesses what we have so we can give again. And then if he can trust us with $5, he can trust us with 50 And so on. And so it's not about the amount. It's about the attitude with which we give. Remember the woman with her lady with her might, two mites? That he put, she put it in. So here's the process. Deuteronomy chapter number 7, verses 15, 7 through 15 says, Is there any poor um, man of your brethren within your gates, in your land, which the Lord your God is giving you? You shall not harden your heart, nor shut your hand from your poor brother, but you shall open your hand wide to him and willingly lend him sufficient for his need, whatever he needs. So God says, this is how you deal with a selfish heart. Open your hand. The only way that it'll get us to be unselfish is if we start giving out. And that works in a lot of other areas of our life is that we have to by faith act and then we get the reward of it. And so the first thing is to deal with a selfish heart. And the only way really to deal with a selfish heart is to give. Yeah. And it's tough. It's hard. But once you get over it, then it's great. And it's easy. And then it says, beware there, lest there be a wicked thought in your heart saying, the seventh year, the year of the release is at hand, and your eye be evil against your poor brother, and you give him nothing, and he cry out to the Lord against you, and it become a sin among you. This is what the law was in the Old Testament scripture, is that a man, if he was in debt, he could go sell himself as a bond servant. So usually when it talks about slavery in the Bible, it's talking about bond servants. This is, I'm in debt, I can't pay my debt. And you find somebody that will pay your debt and you work it off. Well, at the end of seven years, every slave had to be released. And it wasn't like at the end of the seven-year contract, there was a rolling seven years. And so if you got somebody at the beginning of the seven years, it's like you're going to get your money's worth. But what if somebody needed to borrow or they needed lent? And you said, yes, and it's the fifth year already. So God's saying, don't, don't take advantage of your brother. And, and if you do a fifth-year contract, that's yours. So this is in Deuteronomy chapter 15, and that's verse number 9. So, it, so he says, and he cry out to the Lord against you and it become a sin among you. So there was the seventh year of debt release and the selfishness was wickedness. Babies say it's mine, but men say, I'll share the food. So it says, you shall surely give to him and your heart should not be grieved when you give to him. So we've got to deal with a grieving heart. We've got to be able to let go of what we have to bless others. That's just the law of the way it is. And you know what? Becoming a parent really helps with that, doesn't it? <laughs> that helps so much, man. Huh? Yeah. All those, those... N yeah. <laughs> I remember when we went on a motorcycle trip with our friends about 20 years ago when we started motorcycling, and he'd stop at every store, every Carter store there was, and go in and buy something for Braxy. And I'm going, John, come on, man, you've already brought her two things, and we're past another outlet mall, and he's got to swing in, and I'm, I want a hamburger. You know, of course, he was older than I was and had grandkids, but we understand that is that it breaks selfishness in us, doesn't it? or reveal selfishness in us when we have children, when we have somebody in need. So we've got to deal with the grieving heart. And then he says, for because this thing, the Lord your God will bless you in your works and in all which you put your hand in to. In other words, he's showing the law of the harvest is if you see a brother in need, 
You lend to him, and you don't do it grievingly saying, well, I'm only getting a certain amount back, or I'm only getting a low interest rate back. In fact, there were laws that you couldn't charge high interest rates to your brothers. There was a cap that God had put on it, so you couldn't charge usury. You could to a stranger, but you couldn't to your brother. And so God's seeing that he's breaking something. He doesn't want his people to be greedy because he knows if they're not greedy, they will be generous. And if they're generous, they'll be blessed. So that's what he's trying to get us to do is that isn't it wonderful that we have a part to play in what we receive from God? It's not just random. And he says, well, you got it and you don't. Sorry, dude, you don't. And he says this in verse 11, for the poor will never cease from the land. Therefore, I command you saying, you shall open your hand wide to your brother and your poor and your needy in your land. If your brother, a Hebrew man or a Hebrew woman is sold to you and serves six years, then the seventh year you shall let him go from you. And when you send him away free from you, you shall not let him go away empty handed. You shall supply him liberally from your flock from your threshing floor and from the wine press, from what the Lord has blessed you with, you shall give to him. So he's saying, learn to give liberally and generously. Remember, your heart will follow your treasure. The more you give, the more your heart will be attached. Why do you give? Gratitude produces generosity. Because I want to have a generous heart. And where our treasure is, there is our heart also. You put it into your home. And you take care of your home. You give it given a free home? I don't know. I was listening to a report the other day. as Abraham Lincoln's uh, nephew said, I'm broke. I need some money. So Abraham Lincoln wrote him back and said, go earn $3 and I'll give you $3 for every $3 you earn. And he did that for about six months. And his nephew wrote back and said, I don't need money anymore. So what he was doing is he was using that as a tool and say, you earn and I'll give. You earn and I'll give. You earn and I'll give. It's kind of like work fair or something like that. In other words, he was not, there is a principle involved. And, and God didn't want his people to be greedy or selfish. Because then you know what happens? Is there's a time when I need and there's a time when you need. And probably the time of the year that I see that exhibited the most is when people at at this time of the year, the season of Christmas season, I get envelopes and they, or they call me or they talk to me and say, tell us who needs help. And they give me sealed envelopes and I don't know what's in there. I don't know what they're given. And I pass it on. And I just said, this is just from a brother or sister that wants to bless you. Who? Can't tell you. So they give anonymously. Why? Because they love to give, and it feels good to bless that way. We've all heard the stories about the guy that drops 100 bucks in the Salvation Army kettle, or the guy that just gave, uh, paid somebody's bill anonymously. So then he says in verse 15, as we stand, please, you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you. Therefore, I command you this thing today. Let God fill you with gratitude. Four things we have to do. Deal with a selfish heart. Deal with a grieving heart. Learn to give liberally and with generosity. And develop a grateful heart. That's our responsibility, right? I've got to develop that. So remember what it was like before you were saved. Remember where you came from. And remember his promises. Matthew 6 and 21 says, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. If we invest in our brothers and sisters and we invest in the kingdom of God and the church of God, that's where our heart is going to be and it's going to follow that. And the final verse I want to read is that verse we interjected out of 2 Corinthians 9 and 7. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. So here's the thing. I've prayed this many times, and I'm going to pray it again tonight. You can just mumble, or you can say amen, or, you, or, or whatever, because I'm not trying to put pressure on you. But I pray, God, make me generous. You've given to me so I can give. Because you know what? When I exit this world, it's all going to burn, baby. It's gone. 
I've thought about it. And it's been, I've been really keenly aware of this lately. My, my stepmom is probably going to pass away really soon. My, mom, my dad passed away 20 years ago. He left her enough money to live on, and she's probably going to be out of money next month because she had to go into $7,000 a month care home. So that ching, 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 and it's going away. But I've thought about that, and I've had many conversations with her, and she said, well, you know, this was six months ago. Well, you know, eventually I'm just going to end up in a room with a bed and a dresser and a few clothes. But she said, you know what? I know where I'm going. And today when I talk to her, she, she's kind of delusional. I think she's kind of losing it, and she thinks they're trying to poison her when they're feeding her yogurt. But I would think that too because I don't like yogurt. But... But she said, I told your brother, they may walk in one morning and find me laying on the floor dead, but that's all right because I know where I'm going to wake up. So she's kind of fatalistic, but the end run is, I know where I'm going. Yeah. Guess what? The Bible says that life's like a vapor. It's like a flower. It's like a blade of grass. That's, that's sobering to me. But guess what? I'm in the dressing room for eternity. I'm waiting for the wedding. And once I become the bride, I'm going to find out what my husband has prepared for me. And I know that sounds quirky in this day and age. Might want to bleep that off the deal. <laughs> but one day we're going to rule and reign with him. I don't know the sequence of events. I can not tell you. I can tell you some of the signs, but I don't know the sequence. But I know I'm going to live like I'm going to live forever in eternity somewhere. And I'm going to give like I'm laying up treasures where moth and rust don't corrupt and thieves don't break through and steal. And again, this is not just about money. It's about generosity. It's about spirit, a spirit that we can adopt. And it's going to carry into our lessons in March about reaching the lost. Because we found something wonderful and we just want to share it. So you can join me or not, but Jesus, I pray that you would baptize me fresh with the spirit of generosity. That you would give me that passion to give. Not to get, but because I can give. Help me to remember that when I started, I had nothing. And that every good and every perfect gift cometh from you, the Father, down from above, from the Father of lights, in whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Thank you for giving to me, Lord Jesus. And now I want to give back to you of my love and of my spirit. I want to give mercy. I want to give forgiveness. I want to give finance. I want to give so your kingdom can be blessed. And thank you, Lord, for the promise of treasure laid up in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen.